our own experience that we want to pass on to you um, as you go forward in your life with family and business and community. Uh, maybe there will be something in here that will speak to you and uh, we are going to call it a power tool. So power tool number one, um, knowing that your beliefs matter. Uh, so in business, found in your strategic plan or on your wall somewhere, there's mission, vision, and values. Um, <coughs> Done right, uh, the values of a business are translated into behavioral expectations that are familiar, that are talked about, that are measured uh, and evaluated. Um, uh, John, John McCauley and BCF do a great job with that. They have uh, well-defined values. People understand them. It's part of their culture um, to know and live them. And in Virginia Council of CEOs, we have um, four values, four C's we call them. It's convenient. Um, confidentiality is one. Uh, round tables, uh, our round tables live on confidentiality. Uh, communication, which means open and honest communication, and also adhering to our communication protocol, which I'll talk about more in a little while. Uh, commitment is the third. Uh, uh, we have, our members are the busiest people I know. Uh, they've got uh, businesses, they've got to make payroll every week, they've got employees, they've got to Investors, they got partners, they got families at home. A lot of them have kids doing sports and everything else. Um, but um, commitment to this roundtable group uh, has to be uh, agreed to, and, and because they depend on each other. And what we ask for them to commit to is to show up every single month on time, stay for the whole meeting. Um, and then culture is the fourth C. Our culture is one of collaboration and learning. Uh, it's not a place to go and. and um, sell to each other. Um, there's plenty of places to do that. Um, what we say is um, um, we don't sell to each other, we might buy from each other. Um, but the culture is one of let's start at a different level, let's not be looking for what advantage we can get, let's look for what we can learn from each other and what we can teach each other. Um, so it, go ahead. I was going to say it matters the mindset in which you come into the situation. I don't know if you can see the slide all the way from the back, but at the top it's a quote, and Alice from Alice in Wonderland says, this is impossible. And the Mad Hatter says, only if you believe it. Um, the concept is your mindset, your beliefs going into a situation uh, matter a lot. And I had the uh, chance to teach some Cub Scouts about faith and religion. And um, I was sensitive to the fact that not all the Cub Scouts would be Christian and um, wanted to talk globally about that, not specifically about the Christian tradition. And what I told them is that religion is a human activity that responds to God's presence in the world. And if you understand that, then what you talk about as religious practice or practicing your faith, it takes what you believe about God and it puts those beliefs into actions. So your belief matters. For example, in my context, if you believe God exists, then there will be certain behaviors that follow from that. Um, if you believe that God is good, then there will be behaviors that follow from that. If you believe God is dressed up in a black judge's robe and has curly wig hair like an English judge and, and is pointing at you and judging you, then you have a different response to that belief. If you believe that God is powerful or works hard on your behalf, each of these beliefs translates into some kind of, in my context, religious practice. And, um, and so what, we, what I know is that we are highly motivated in our actions and, and the outward expressions of who we are that starts with the core of our beliefs. And, um, and I think that's what you're saying about the work in the, um, the council. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Council number two. Connecting to the need to be known. I alluded to this a little bit when I told the story of Grace in the hospital. Uh, from that point on, I had a more powerful understanding um, about how much our identity matters to us. If you um, looked up Master Greeter on the internet, which I have done, by the way, and I've looked for training for my ushers and my greeters and that sort of thing. What you find in terms of tips is you need to learn people's names. Our names matter to us because they're ours. And the extent that 
These are things you already know. If you meet somebody, you repeat their name two or three times, and you continue to use their name so that you can learn their name. Why? Because their name is important to them. And in our culture, that is a primary way in which we are known. But the human need is deeper than that. It's a need to be known more fully and more completely than just the name tag. Um, there's a Matthew West contemporary Christian song. It's called, my, Hello, My Name Is. And his name is Child of the One True King. And he starts out uh, naming all the things that he's ever been called. Uh, it comes from a real life example of a football player who got injured his first season in college and got addicted to painkillers and uh, couldn't play football, couldn't study. He, he became a drug addict and, and he wrote this letter to Matthew West and um, talked about his transformation. And um, he doesn't dispense with that drug addiction history, he uses it. And the desire to be known is not just to be beloved and adored, but it's to be very known and accepted anyway. And, um, and, and that is a core source of our power in relationship, is taking the time and the, having the ability to truly know people. And, and that's really the, the meat and potatoes of what we do at Virginia Council of CEOs in uh, small groups and round tables. Um, you can't be really known in a crowd. Uh, <coughs> it takes a small group and a, a safe environment to become known beyond the service. And um, when we form a new CEO roundtable, one of the first things we do is, is uh, an exercise called Lifeline. And we have give everybody about 20 minutes to graph out their life. And they graph the high points and the low points, the, the births and deaths, the tragedies, the successes. And then um, each member presents their Lifeline to the rest of the group. Um, it always amazes me, the eagerness of these button-down, guarded, hard-charging CEOs to share their life, and they want to share um, the, the tragedies, and they want to share, share the successes and the shame and their pride. Um, there are always tears, and uh, this is, again, eight or ten hard-charging CEOs. Um, people are dying to be known. and. Um, there's power in giving them ways to do that. When you were talking, Scott, it reminded me of the days when you would uh, work with the confirmation uh, youth 100 years ago. And um, they would have speakers like Scott and other um, adults come in and do a, a faith timeline for the sixth grade students. <clears throat> And they modeled for the students, these are the highs and lows in my life. This is where I felt God. This is where I didn't feel God. This is how I know God was with me. And, and they were uh, modeling for these sixth graders um, this kind of vulnerability. Because the sixth graders um, were then going to make posters about themselves. And they were going to present those posters about who they were. And, um, and again, what we tap into is that real profound human desire to be more fully known. Um, because in that vulnerability, we can make the connections that lead to uh, the transformations and the work that we want to get done in the world. This is my favorite one. I call it embracing the ING of life. I-N-G for me is that ending, it makes, I don't know, a verb into a participle or a gerund or something like that. But to me it denotes action. Um, you, it's not simply a state of being, it's a state of becoming. And um, in a sense we're all people becoming. We are women becoming, we are men becoming, we are Christians becoming, we are marketing executives becoming. We're on this journey of making ourselves in real time. And the I, I my lesson in this is that I've learned how important it is to embrace the ING of life. I had this philosophy before I went to seminary, but when I went to seminary and studied uh, Greek, I wanted to go to Duke for seminary where I had gone to undergraduate, but we were trying to adopt our children, and adoption is a state process. Um, and you might think, oh, you just wanted to go to Duke because it was a great school. I wanted to go to Duke because they didn't require you to take Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> 
And at Union, they required you to take a year of Greek and a year of Hebrew, which you would then use to translate passages of the Old and New Testament. And, um, let me just say, reading out loud in Hebrew class was worse than anything I ever did in law school. Um, but I did take all the knowledge in. And in Greek, uh, we paid a lot of attention to the tense of verbs and how they were in the original language and what, how that might inform what we were saying. And very early on, we focused on what is a familiar passage to many people, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And when we looked at that in the Greek language, what we found is more of the participle, future, present and future tense. Um, and, and a more literal translation of that passage would be, for God is so loving the world. And the difference in that is love has to our American ears this concept of it happened once in time, but is loving has this ongoing and continuous um, flavor to it. And that struck me so profoundly um, that I changed the way I talk to Scott about things. No longer do I tell him I love you, but I tell him I am loving you. And, um, and that's what I mean by embracing the ING of life. There's always possibility, there's always something becoming. And um, so you get at this active, ongoing, moving, and intensifying uh, moving from maybe lesser to greater, moving from, from less to more. And in my Hebrew class, we, um, Hebrew, you know, they go from right to left, and they don't have the same alphabet we have, and they don't even have vowels. They have these little marks uh, to intensify or change things. And there's this one called a dagesh. It's a dot, a dagesh. And what I learned is that in Hebrew, the word learner, and teacher are the same word, except for the dagesh. So when you come upon the word learner, um, you see it without that intensifying punctuation. But through the process of the ing of life, learners become teachers. And the Hebrew language embodies that by having just that one punctuation mark, the dagesh, that turns a learner into a teacher. And that, for me, speaks again to the ING of life. And, um, and there's, you might call it potential energy if you were in physics class or something like that. There's something to be harnessed there by embracing the ING of life. Scott embraces it. I did. Um, so expressing gratitude, number four. Um, I know this guy named Bill. I did uh, a small favor for Bill several years ago, and, and it was not a big deal. I think I introduced him to somebody that led to a business deal or something. And uh, But every time I see Bill, Bill lights up. His hands come up, and he says, Scott, it's so good to see you. You're my favorite person. How are you? And I feel, I feel special. He expresses his gratitude over and over. Um, that's remarkable. And, you know, I might... <clears throat> I don't, I don't know, but if there's anybody around that I want to do something for, it's it's Bill, you know, because I feel this this sense of gratitude coming at me all the time. I want to perform for that guy because he feeds me that gratitude. Um, so I'm always looking for ways to help Bill. And um, when you think about that in a business context, gratitude is a very powerful um, motivator for your people and for your partners and folks like that. So. In the business context, you may not think of thank you as a very difficult thing to say. But just in the human context, thank you is a very difficult thing to say. And, and um, there was a song, I think it was Elton John, sorry seems to be the hardest word. Some of you people know that song. Yeah, Diana's nodding. Um, well, I would say thank you seems to be the hardest word. And um, the reason thank you is so hard for human beings is in order to say thank you, you have to do what we don't do very well, which is to recognize that you had a need. And um, I learned this particularly when my father had Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. Uh, it paralyzes you. Uh, your brain doesn't send any signals to your muscles for nutrients or for motion or anything like that. And so my father was basically paralyzed in his body. We got involved with the ALS Association, and I read this story. Um, about a woman whose mother had ALS. 
and her mother was fastidious and liked to clean house. And, um, and so the daughter thought, well, mom and I are sitting in the kitchen. I will do something to please mother. And she got up and she was sweep, sweeping the floor. And, um, and, and she was joyfully doing this, thinking about how delighted her mother would be um, as she did this small act of service for her. And um, at the end of it all, when the daughter sat back down with the mother, um, instead of saying thank you, the mother said, you missed a spot. And that wasn't because the mother was a mean or ornery person. It's because if you've ever been in that situation, it is so hard to be needy. It is so hard to say thank you because it's hard to be in the state of being that needs something for which you say thank you. I teach a class on prayer and um, I take prayer as a relationship and we go through different degrees of intimacy of relationship and thank you is about in the middle. Uh, it's not the least intimate and it's not the most intimate way of being in relationship but it requires a certain measure of vulnerability because you are saying to God if you are praying uh, thank you I needed something thank you I didn't have all the answers thank you I was in a situation of less power and needed to have something come my way and in fact I tell people when they ask me if I if they could change one thing in their lives uh, I invite them to use thank you as a prayer on a regular basis uh, because that changes your relationship and um, it changes your way of being in the world. And um, so expressing gratitude is a way to tap in to a real sense of power, uh, both with other people and within yourself. Offering messages of appreciation. Um, you're probably reading this slide saying, well, isn't offering messages of appreciation just the same as saying thank you? And I'm gonna say no. Um, thank you involves there was a specific need or situation and you are giving thanks or gratitude for that. A message of appreciation is much more about the fundamental presence, worth, value, um, being of the other person. So it's possible to say thank you for sweeping the floor, but a message of appreciation might be um, I really like the way you are helpful. Um, it, it takes a trait or um, a characteristic of the individual. And I have really learned the value of expressing messages of appreciation as Scott and I have um, started our family meetings. Did you want to tell them or do you want me to tell them? Um, so, uh, I don't know, six months or so ago, uh, we started this ritual having a weekly family meeting with our three kids um, every Sunday evening. And there's a particular agenda and the, the, the really the first thing on the agenda is messages of appreciation and as you can imagine the kids are you know been watching football and running around and, and they don't really want to sit down and have a meeting with us <laughs> so uh, but once we start doing this ritual of messages of appreciation each person has the chance or is asked to for each other person to offer a message of appreciation or a thank you or a, I admire uh, something and it, it brings us 